I haven't met. I'm uh, Ahmed Al Basi of uh, PGY4 or C1 in uh, cardiology at U of T. Uh, I wanted to speak about this topic because I thought it was uh, quite important as we are seeing over the past few decades more and more cases of uh, rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease. And I wanted to uh, comment on what the most common kind of valvular abnormality is uh, with regards to rheumatic heart disease, which is rheumatic mitral stenosis. To start off with a little bit of a history, um, Dr. Chow special. So uh, it, it initially was actually described by a, a, a British pediatrician called Dr. Cheeto. This was in uh, 1889. Um, and he kind of traveled the world and, and wrote memoirs and everything. And this was one of the things that he reported. And uh, But the diagnosis criteria for actual for rheumatic fever in itself was not established until later on kind of in uh, the 18 to 1900s. In 1944, it was uh, a Dr. Duckett Jones who actually put in the rheumatic fever criteria. Um, and then with regards to rheumatism, that word in itself was actually discovered in the early 1600s by a Dr. Uh, Guillaume Bellou. So that's a bit of history. Um, with regards to epidemiology, it is the uh, the most common cardiovascular disease in children and in young people that are less than 25 years of age. Uh, there's more than 33 cases of rheumatic heart disease worldwide, globally. Um, <clears throat> but unfortunately, a lot of these cases, there may be much more because there's frequent underrepresentation due to underreporting. A lot of times, um, these, uh, the, uh, the countries that are affected mostly have scarce healthcare resources and kind of few... Uh, uh, overall systemic registry programs, and so it may actually be more than 33 uh, million cases. Um, they're obviously more common in underdeveloped countries, but it now just become a global issue just because of um, you know the demographic shifts due to immigration. In the U.S., it holds the eighth rank with regards to death, with regards to years of life lost, and uh, a standardized mortality rates, and they're more common kind of in the uh, Oceania, uh, South Asian population or uh, Central Sub-Saharan Africa. I just want to touch just a little bit on the pathophysiology of rheumatic fever in itself, uh, because I think it's uh, it's interesting. So basically, you get a group A strep infection, and this is mostly in the children population with strep pyogenes. Uh, this causes a tonsillopharyngitis uh, through a mechanism called molecular mimicry. Uh, so secretly antibodies are formed towards the molecules of a group A strep. And then what happens is that this antibody then recognizes that molecules in the heart, in the brain, in the joints, and gives us this kind of overall autoimmune response with infiltration and a T-cell mediated response, giving us a syndrome, which is arthritis when it attacks the joints, uh, carditis when it attacks the heart, which is usually what we... Uh, uh, what we look for in valvulitis, Korea or Sydenham's Korea or St. Vitus's dance. Thomas Sydenham was uh, was also a British pediatrician. Um, erythema marginatum when it, when it affects the skin. So it's kind of a multi-system disorder and we need to exercise a high bit of, um, kind of caution when we're uh, at a low threshold to investigate these symptoms in children. Um, and then once you get valvulitis, there's this, uh, again, there's this um, inflammatory reaction causing uh, thickening of the valves, calcification, which gives us uh, valvular stenosis and re regurgitation, and it can affect essentially any valve. The most commonly affected one is the mitral valve. Um, and obviously, with the valvular stenosis and regurgitation, as we know, we get our multiple um, consequences, heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, uh, arrhythmias, commonly atrial fibrillation. Um, I won't go into too much detail about this, but these are from the ACC 2015's revised Jones criteria. Um, so you, you do need to have an evidence of an antecedent uh, group A strep infection. Sometimes it's an ASO titer, a positive strep culture, and you, um, you do need two major or one uh, major and two minor criteria to confirm it. Um, as we see here, the, the criteria are by low-risk populations and moderate to high-risk populations. The major criteria is any evidence of carditis, either clinical or subclinical, um, arthritis or polyarthritis or, or myoarthritis, then you have uh, chorea, uh, subcutaneous nodules, erythema marginatum, and then these are our minor criteria, which is a fever, 
uh, monoarthritis or elevated inflammatory markers uh, or pro prolonged PR interval in the absence of heart illness. So what echocardiographic features actually constitute a diagnosis of pruritus? So, you know, we do have this in our, in our guidelines, but what exactly does this mean? So the uh, ACC 2015's uh, uh, criteria on rheumatic fever uh, said and recommended that we should perform echo with Doppler assessment in patient, all patients with suspected uh, acute rheumatic fever. And it is reasonable that initially, if we even if you don't have carditis on the initial echocardiogram, it's reasonable to keep kind of doing serial echocardiography if uh, we think that there is still a suspicion of rheumatic fever. Uh, with regards to echo and Doppler testing, we should be doing it even in the absence of you know the usual auscultatory findings. So just putting a, uh, the stethoscope and listening is not enough. And if you do not find features that are consistent with carditis, or you, you know, you, you think that those valve abnormalities are due to something else uh, that's easily explained on the echocardiogram, then you could uh, easily say, uh, you know, that this is so it's safely say this is not um, carditis. Um, and so these were the uh, initial ACC 2015 criteria. Uh, but again, what is carditis? So there are specific uh, uh, criteria which existed. Um, with regards to uh, echocardiographic features of this. Uh, with regards to, they only have uh, essentially just um, uh, documented mitral regurgitation or aortic regurgitation, but as we, and this, these are the most commonly affected valves in acute rheumatic. Uh, so mitral regurgitation, um, you do need all four of these criteria. So it should be seen in two or more views. The jet length should be more than two centimeters your peak velocity of more than three, and it should be a pan-systolic uh, MR. With regards to AI, similar, uh, so should be seen in two or more views. The jet length should be more than one, our peak velocity of more than three, and should be uh, a pan-diastolic murmur, uh, pan-diastolic Doppler find. So this is specific for Dopplers. Um, anything that's more than kind of trace AR or MR in children, should be considered pathological provided we've ensured that there's no other non-rheumatic causes. So there are obviously there's congenital mitral stenosis, there's you know uh, mitral uh, prolapse and all that, and, and so that could cause uh, some mitral regurgitation. So provided our non-rheumatic causes are excluded, um, we the flow jet should produce a complete uh, Doppler profile. Um, and with regards to specifically mitral regurgitation, acute rheumatic failure, even up to eighty four percent. 84 to 94 percent of cases can have a mitral rotation on, on your initial echo or subsequently on serial echoes. And the jet, just because of the involvement of the anterior mitral leaflet, is usually posterior laterally direct. Um, with regards to morphological features of uh, rheumatic fever, I spoke about the Doppler findings, but morphologically, it may be hard to see uh, valvulitis morphologically initially in, in early, especially acute rheumatic fever. So it's absence doesn't rule out the diagnosis. That's why we should use Doppler. Uh, the most common valve that's affected is our mitral valve. When it's present, uh, the most common abnormality is valvular thickening, and you may or may not have a restricted leaflet mobility. Often the valvular thickening is seen as the free edge of the leaflet as the rheumatic uh, infection gets worse. We see nodularity and further calcification, but you can see nodularity or beating along the length of the leaflet so even early on. Um, so what is a thick leaflet? So we should measure these with our tissue harmonics turned off just to ensure that you know, your apparent tissue thickness is not higher. Our normal uh, mitral valve thickness should be corrected for age. So when we're doing uh, pediatric echocardiograms, our normal and mitral valve thickness usually less than three is the recommendation by ASC, uh, three millimeters in healthy children and adults anywhere less than 3.5 is, is considered normal. Uh, with the aortic valve, it's a little, um, uh, it's a little different. It's, around, it's thinner than the mitral valve, so I'm 0.67 in anyone less than 20 years. As we uh, get older within the 20 to 60 range, it gets a little thicker around 0.87 and then subsequently above 60 is 1.42. So any apparent thickness um, of the valves then should be noted and, and, and should be measured.
so this here shows a, a good example of um, valvulitis and rheumatic heart disease. So figure A over here, you see the yellow line shows kind of a thickening of the mitral valve. And then we also see some, uh, looks like uh, some mitral regurgitation with uh, severe mitral, actually moderate severe mitral regurgitation over there. Um, you can see, this is from a 10 year old boy who actually presented with dyspnea. Um, so over here, and then uh, figure B, uh, this is in uh, diastoles or parasternal long axis views of the heart, uh, different phases of diastole kind of in the same patient. We can see uh, a portal tear here, in, uh, in, uh, what, which is what the red arrow is pointing to, and that's a nodular kind of thickening of the mitral, uh, mitral valve uh, uh, leaflet tips in, um, in diastole. This is our 3D uh, view of the mitral orifice, which is at the level of the mitral leaflets in diastole. Our mitral valve is open. We see our kind of nodular thickening around it. And then there's also some rheumatic affection of our uh, aortic valve here. Uh, we see some thickening. Um, so this is kind of consistent with, uh, with valvulitis. Uh, it's more so kind of in the pediatric population, uh, but I thought it was, uh, it's, it's also kind of important to mention. Uh, so rheumatic heart disease in itself is, is, is the most common uh, kind of global etiology of, of mitral stenosis. Obviously, there are other causes, severe calcific mitral stenosis, uh, degenerative, and then uh, general mitral stenosis, for example. But with regards to global causes, rheumatic heart disease is the most common um, etiology. What happens with um, rheumatic, uh, rheumatic heart disease, you get progressive kind of narrowing of your mitral valve area due to thickening of the mitral valve, but the hallmark is actually fusion of the commissures. Uh, your normal MBA is four to six uh, in adults, and then once you have progressive narrowing to less than 2.5, then it becomes kind of more significant. Um, when you do have your narrowing of your mitral valve area, you get this kind of progressive rise in your left atrial pressure because of the very tight orifice that your blood that your left atrium is pushing through. This in the long run causes uh, remodeling of the left atrium and this transfers pressures or causes high pressures in the pulmonary venous system, our pulmonary arterial system, and then subsequently this is transferred into our right heart uh, and we see evidence of right heart dysfunction. We can get functional tricuspid regurgitation uh, enlarged right atrium, enlarged right ventricle. Uh, with regards to symptoms, most of the time symptoms are shortness of breath on exertion. Uh, you get orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. If you think of the involvement of your right side, you get right sided symptoms. Um, there are some more kind of rare um, symptoms. So you get dysphagia, which is actually known as Ortner syndrome, which is when you have an enlarged left atrium or an enlarged left auricle, this kind of causes a back, uh, backward pressure on your esophagus. This could cause potentially dysphagia. And then hemoptysis with uh, chronic pulmonary arterial hypertension um, could also uh, theoretically be, be present and has been uh, noted as well. All of these factors and all these symptoms uh, with mitral stenosis, a very hemodyne that is a dynamic valvular issue. So they're affected by factors that increase transmitral flow. So a high cardiac output, be it by you know um, overall kind of increase in cardiac output, pregnancy, tachycardia, exercise, um, hyperthyroidism, anemia, or a shortened diastolic filling time, tachy tachycardia, tachyarrhythmias. These could, these will make your symptoms worse, and these will. Uh, potentially increase your, your transmitral gradient. Uh, so based on the WHO criteria, your transmitral pressure gradient, um, MS, rheumatic MS, is a transmitral pressure gradient of more than four uh, with at least two morphological features. So the rheumatic involvement in the, uh, with regards to the morphological features, the hallmark is usually uh, fusion of the commissures. Uh, the second is usually um, leaflet thickening, as we mentioned, and this can be present with or without calcification. Uh, the third is restricted leaflet motion. So when you, it's mostly of the, of, so you have the restricted posterior leaflet movement and then uh, a restricted anterior mitral leaflet opening, which gives you a, a classical doming or hockey stick appearance uh, during diastole. And then you also have 
uh, portal shortening and uh, uh, and thickening, which should be uh, demonstrated on um, on echocardiography as well. Um, where do we see these views best? With the diastolic doming of, of the anterior mitral leaflet, we see it best in the parasternal long axis view. Uh, restricted posterior can be seen in a parasternal long. The best way is, is, uh, is the parasternal short. Uh, commissural uh, fusion is best seen in, in your parasternal short or your 3D views. Um, and this gives you your classic kind of small oval or funnel shaped kind of opening of your mitral valve, which gives you the classic uh, fish mouth appearance. And then uh, your portal shortening and your, uh, your thickening and fusion, this may be seen in both your parasternal long axis views, but may also be seen in your apical views as well. Uh, so here we see some, uh, two, these are some of the morphological features of mitral regurgitation. So the first one we see here is kind of by commissural fusion. This is our short axis in view of the heart. Um, and this is the best uh, way in which we can, uh, the, the best uh, view in which we can demonstrate commissural fusion. Here we see our thickened um, mitral leaflets with some nodularity, nodular thickening at the tips. Uh, this is in diastole, very tight mitral valve um, and, uh, and uh, kind of a diastolic doming of the anterior mitral leaflet. Over here in C, uh, we also see this kind of diastolic doming of the anterior mitral leaflet with overall thickened uh, cords and then uh, kind of a restricted uh, motion of the, of the posterior mitral leaflet. Uh, and then over here, we see kind of our subvabular apparatus and subvabular thickening and calcification on our uh, parasternal long axis. We can also see this on our uh, apical leaflets. Uh, so how do we assess our mitral valve, uh, area, uh, mitral valve on echocardiography? There are multiple ways in which we can do so. Um, with regards to mitral valve area itself, um, the, the, one of the better methods to do is planimetry. Uh, this can be done 2D echo or a 3D echo. Another way in which we could potentially measure the um, MVA is, as we know, uh, the, the pressure halftime to our uh, continuous wave Doppler. And then some less common ways in which we use them, but it can be theoretically used is through our PISA method and our continuity equation. And then we um, will talk about kind of getting the mitral valve gradient. Uh, so with regards to planimetry, uh, the main thing is with planimetry is that we need to ensure that um, our short uh, axis imaging, so this is on our parasternal short axis view of the heart, we need to ensure that this is positioned at the tip of the valve. I'll show, I'll demonstrate that in a little bit, but this is to avoid overestimation because if you go deeper into the mitral leaflet, you could potentially overestimate your mitral valve area. Uh, with regards to, so one way in which we can do this is you can image the subvalvular region in your short axis and then kind of slowly tilt your transducer at the tip of the valve, which is where Theoretically, your mitral valve area would be highest, um, sorry, would be the most accurate. Um, the smallest orifice area could also be traced in kind of the zoom mode and then with a, kind of an optimized gain and uh, just to avoid a, a single dropout, which could affect your measurement. Um, and we should avoid kind of excessive gain because this could cause some overestimation. Um, 3D is, is, uh, is useful for measuring it, and in, in if you have a mitral valve opening that's kind of irregular um, or is, is eccentrically oriented, if you have uh, multiplanar imaging, this is kind of, it can kind of determine the, the correct short axis orientation on 3D uh, parallel to the orifice and at the level of the tip. So this is why uh, 3D echo is, is preferred. Uh, for planimetry, especially if you have a mitral valve that's kind of irregularly shaped. Uh, so it's more accurate and reproducible than 2D echo, and it also is better for our uh, overall commissural fusion assessment. Uh, so this is kind of what I meant by uh, it's, it's kind of the way you're cutting it on your transthoracic echo does kind of go a long way in determining your mitral valve area. So as we see here, this is, uh, this is a case of severe mitral stenosis. Our valve area is 0.6. This is on 2D planimetry. Um, here we see 
And what's, what this illustrates is, is a figure, I'm sorry, a line one is you're cutting it at the leaflet tips, um, which is the best estimate of your mitral valve area. But as you go into uh, the mitral valve leaflets, um, then you could potentially overestimate your mitral valve area. Uh, you could use orthogonal or kind of biplane views, um, such as with here, um, and, and make sure that your leaflet tips are at the tip. Um, and then when you look at your short axis, you'll be able to measure your MVA and you know that your that this is at the leaflet tips. Um, so this here shows your uh, kind of 3D view. Uh, this is on trans uh, esophageal echo. So figure A here shows uh, what this visualizes is kind of the, uh, uh, the stenotic valve area on your LA LV views. And then kind of planimetry over here with an irregularly kind of shaped uh, mitral valve. Um, so we see that 3D would be better suited for that type of, uh, of mitral valve opening. Uh, now, this is kind of with um, with regards to just uh, planimetry and mitral valve area assessment, but the mitral valve area and gradient could also be assessed via hemodynamic assessment. So um, this includes measurements of the mitral valve area by our pressure half time, uh, direct measurements of our pressure half time, uh, and kind of estimation of our left atrial, right atrial pressures, um, and, uh, and and pulmonary uh, pulmonary pressures as well, as we do know. Uh, chronic rheumatic uh, mitral stenosis does cause kind of a, a pulmonary hypertension as well. Um, so the transmitral gradient is measured from your apical window uh, by using a CW uh, aligned coaxially with your mitral inflow. What you will be able to get is your VTI of your transmitral flow, which you can trace to get your uh, mitral valve gradient um, and your pressure half time. Your pressure half time can be used for calculation of your mitral valve area, which we'll get to in the next few slides. Um, we always need to uh, note what the heart rate is because, as we know, uh, mitral stenosis is a dynamic valvular issue. So it's very flow and heart rate dependent, and we shouldn't be relying on it solely as the only parameter of, of assessing MS severity. So any high output state, any tachycardia, and any concurrent mitral regurgitation could potentially cause an increase in your flow velocity across your mitral valve and subsequently your pressure gradient. And we should always note the rhythm and the heart rate um, in atrial fibrillation. Um, uh, I don't know if Dr. Chisholm is on the line, but did teach us this, uh, but in atrial fibrillation, planimetry is, is better than your pressure half-time measurements. Um, and this was demonstrated on a study, I think it was in 2009 or 2008. Um, but basically, you have your, um, you do need to report your rhythm and your heart rate. Obviously, systolic and diastolic function of the left ventricle should be reported, but you know, early on, especially, you don't usually see uh, much with regards to um, LV dysfunction. Uh, so the pressure half time in itself is essentially the time that's required for your instantaneous pressure gradient to decrease by half from its peak value at early uh, mitral inflow. Um, so the, the, what we use is a, um, is a 220 over the pressure half time and uh, the velocity at which the, uh, the pressure half time is such a, the, the velocity at which the gradient declines to uh, one half of its peak is actually equal to 0.7 times the peak velocity. So um, this is the more common uh, equation that we do use of 220 over the pressure half time. But the pressure half time itself does have some limitations. So compared to planimetry, it does uh, sometimes yield a smaller mitral valve area when you have extensive subvalvular disease. The pressure half time is affected by left any uh, uh, factor that may affect the compliance of your left atrial and left ventricle. So if there is a left atrial, um, uh, what you're trying to measure is your LALV gradient. So if there is any um, uh, issue with the compliance of those, uh, of those chambers, then you could potentially yield a smaller mitral valve area even than, uh, when you're measuring your pressure half time. Um, so anything that may affect uh, the compliance, such as, for example, LV hypertrophy, uh, any concurrent aortic regurgitation, any um, left atrial fibrosis, AFib, those things may affect your pressure half time. 
uh, significant mitral regurgitation may also reduce your reliability and you may actually uh, risk kind of underestimating the valve area. Um, and it could be uh, misleading, especially if you do it immediately after your uh, 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 balloon valve autonomy. Uh, when you have patients who are in atrial fibrillation, one way in which you could potentially make the pressure halftime more valuable to you is you know, you could take uh, more measurements, so at least uh, five measurements is what the ASC recommends and as average to kind of to provide um, estimation of your pressure gradient and your valve area. What you would avoid is uh, like extremely short cycles and you would avoid extremely long cycles. If you don't have the, you have multiple kind of short cycles, then you could just take the longest one um, and the longest speed alone, and that could be sufficient, but uh, there may be other ways such as planimetry to measure your NDA if you, if you have atrial fibrillation. Um, this is a nice demonstration of you know, your pressure halftime measurements. We have our hemodynamic kind of left ventricular gram and your left atrial pressure. We see an elevated left atrial pressure here and the diastolic rating between our left atrium and the left ventricle and mitral stenosis. Um, so, and then we also see uh, here your um, in, uh, the mitral valve gradient, which you can use uh, the VTI of to trace the mitral valve gradient. Um, and then uh, over here is our Vmax and our uh, uh, and this is our pressure half time. So uh, we measure it from uh, from our Vmax to uh, around 1.4 uh, Vmax over 1.4, which is over here. And the overall and the equation again is 220 over your pressure half time. Um, with regards to other measure, methods of measuring your MBA, um, I mentioned the PISA and the continuity equation. So the continuity equation assumes that, your, that the volume of your forward flow across that uh, orifice, in this case, your mitral valve, uh, is equal to the flow across another reference valve. So typically what we use here is the aortic valve. So um, you can't use the mitral valve, the, uh, MBA by continuing occasion if you have concurrent aortic valve pathology. Um, so MBA by continuing equation is, is essentially measured when you take your uh, cross-sectional area of your LVOT and you times it by your VTI of your LVOT and you get that ratio with your VTI of the mitral. There are limitations. As we see, there are multiple uh, measurements here. And the more measurements you have, the more and the more assumptions you make, so there's more margin of error. Uh, so this is why your continuity equation has kind of fallen out of favor. Um, you may be able to theoretically calculate your MBA, but there hasn't been kind of large studies validating it. And you should not use your um, your uh, continuity equation when you have concurrent significant AI or if you have MR because it kind of goes against what the continuity equation initially assumes, uh, which is that the, the volume is equal uh, across those two valves. If there is only uh, AI, um, then you could potentially use uh, with, uh, your uh, flow across your pulmonic valve and your uh, RBOT, so potentially you could use that and use your pulmonic valve as your reference valve. Uh, but as we mentioned, there are better ways of measuring the MBA. Uh, the PISA method, um, uh, we use this more for mitral regurgitation, but essentially the PISA method is, is a proximize of velocity surface area. And uh, what it is is that there's this notion that as your flow approaches a, uh, a, a circular kind of finite area, which is your mitral valve, um, then what we see is when you are dropping our baseline, a concentric kind of a hemispherical isovelocity shelf. These are formed when you're going from the left atrium through something with a very small surface area, and this increases their velocity through that area. And so you see that isovelocity shelf. Limitations is that it, is, it does require multiple measurements. Uh, it may be technically demanding. Um, and then uh, also interestingly, the, uh, these isovelocity shells, when you're doing it specifically in rheumatic mitral stenosis, just because of, um, of the, the angle at which your mitral valve opens, 
It's kind of more funnel shaped and it opens at less than uh, 180 degrees. And so your actual flow convergence zone of your pizza may actually be non-hemispherical. Um, and so your shell, uh, your the isoc velocity shell may not be uh, optimal. So this has also kind of fallen out of favor. So uh, with regards to overall uh, MBA assessment, PISA and the continuity equation not recommended routinely in practice. Theoretically, they can be used, but just because of the complexity and multiple sources of error, uh, then you know we usually use the parametry. Uh, so again, this is a nice demonstration. We see on figure, uh, the, the first figure over here, we see an evidence of uh, severe mitral regurgitation. The pressure half time here is uh, quite long, 379. Um, our mitral valve area is 0.58. So this is consistent with severe mitral stenosis with the long pressure half time. Our VTI tracing, which is here with our blue line to calculate our mitral valve gradient. Uh, this is on a transesophageal uh, echocardiogram. So initially what we see here is our initial deceleration slope, which is our red line is more steep than the, uh, than the mid diastolic uh, slope. So the recommendation is that we, um, uh, we take the one where there's kind of a more gradual decay. Uh, so the, the, the white lines should be, uh, should be traced rather than using your early steep deceleration slope to, to, to uh, uh, be able to do your uh, pressure half time. Uh, this is on your transesophageal echo. This is just to demonstrate our PISA method. Um, this is our kind of isovelocity shell. Uh, this is kind of more uh, hemispherical, uh, so potentially could be used uh, if theoretically. Um, with regards to staging, as we know with the, with the recent ACC staging, this more so mild and moderate is more so stage B or progressive. This here is, uh, is more so stage C or severe um, symptomatic or symptomatic. Uh, with regards to mild, uh, this is usually when your MBA is above 2.5. As you approach um, a, a valve area of less than that, it approaches moderate up to 1.6, and then anything less than 1.5, is considered severe. Your pressure half time, anything above 150 is considered severe. So the higher your pressure half time, the higher the time that we're uh, 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 going down um, on our peak, then the, the more severe the narrowing is. And our mean gradient of more than two. And as we noted, we always have to uh, note when, what heart rate this mean gradient was collected. So what do we report um, on our transthoracic echo in these patients? So, uh, you know, I wondered um, about this when I, was, when I was researching this. So valvular findings, we do need to report what the extent and our overall pattern of the commissural fusion is. So is it bicommissural, is it unicommissural? Um, how fused are the commissures? Uh, this should be noted. Um, how uh, severe um, and the degree of our valvular thickening and your calcification. Um, we need to uh, report our subvalvular abnormalities and our severity of our, of our valve area and our gradient. But we also need to note the um, associated findings. So our left atrial size, as we know with chronic uh, MS, you get left atrial enlargement and left atrial remodeling. So our we, 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 should, uh, uh, we should mention our left atrial volume index, right atrial size as well, and right ventricular size uh, because of uh, elevated right-sided pressures. Um, and then if present, uh, we would uh, comment on the presence of whether there is spontaneous echo contrast or smoke or thrombi in our uh, left atrium or uh, left atrial appendage. And then uh, frequently with the rheumatic MS, we sometimes do see rheumatic infection of the other valves. So any other valvular abnormality should be reported as this also may affect uh, management. I wanted to touch on uh, stress echocardiography and mitral stenosis, as it was mentioned in uh, the ACC um, valve guidelines. So as we know, um, rheumatic MS is a, is a progressive um, disorder. It does have an insidious natural history. Uh, patients may be compensated for a long time. Patients may remain asymptomatic at baseline, and they may not be exerting themselves, and they may not be noticing their symptoms. 
or the, the, there may be some discrepancy between your imaging data, your mitral valve area, your, your gradient in the patient is quite symptomatic. So um, stress echocardiography may be yeah, assessed, may be used to overall assess your functional uh, significance of your mitral stenosis. You can do this with exercise or a patient's can't exercise with tibutamine. Um, it's, you know, it's favored to exercise, obviously, when you can, uh, if a patient can. Uh, ways in which you could would be, you know, you could even use an alternate leg raising. A lot of times we use uh, a recumbent uh, bicycle. Um, and, uh, and a lot of times, you know, sometimes what we, um, we use a treadmill as well. And so what we measure is a transmitral gradient, our stroke volume, our MVA, uh, our pulmonary pressures, and then our overall LV and RV function. And if there is any MR, any change in the MR does become more severe. Um, and maybe that the MR is what's causing patient symptoms and not the MS. And so it's, it's uh, stress echocardiography may be helpful in elucidating whether these symptoms are due to our data or not. What the ANC is recommend is a positive is an increase in your transmitral gradient of above uh, 15 um, with exercise or with the butamine uh, of above 18. Um, this may help explain if our symptoms are due to MS. And then if there's a rise in our pulmonary pressures of above 60, this may be another marker for significant MS. So some caution in interpreting this as we, uh, we know, you know, pulmonary pressures uh, we rise, you know, with with exercise, and we do need to have some kind of age cutoffs as well for this. Um, so when we uh, when we're overall interpreting this, we should uh, exercise some caution when we're interpreting the uh, pulmonary pressure um, uh, variable. But overall, what we're looking at is a rise in the gradient. How often do we perform serial echocardiograms? Uh, so clinically. You know, when you have your progressive stage B or mild, but anywhere above 1.5, usually is a recommendation by the ACC is that every three to five years, we would do um, a, a transthoracic echo. When you get to the more severe range, if your MBA is between 1 to 1.5, then that's more so within one to two years. And then uh, once you get to less than one, then every year, or sometimes even more than six, every six months, patients would, uh, would be uh, measuring their mitral valve area. And I want to touch on just kind of when do we intervene on mitral stenosis? Um, if you, so these are from the more recent uh, 20, uh, 2020, 2020 um, valve guidelines. Uh, so anyone who's symptomatic with AYG class two, three, four, if you have severe rheumatic a a MS and you have a favorable valve morphology, which I'll get to in a little bit, uh, and less than moderate MR, and what they felt was less than moderate MR is less than two plus or uh, MR. In the absence of an LA thrombus, then we would recommend as uh, as a first uh, first line to do a balloon valvuloplasty. Um, you know, this is this is keeping in mind that the gradients after balloon valvuloplasty may initially improve, but may subsequently get worse. And so this is just kind of buying some time with the patient's native valve. Um, if you have severely symptomatic patients, but they're not candidates for valvuloplasty, if they failed a previous, if they need a, another cardiac procedure, if they don't have any, if there's no access to balloon valvuloplasty, then you would do mitral valve surgery, either with a repair, a majorotomy, or a valve replacement. Um, most of the time, I've seen replacement done. Um, in asymptomatic patients, if they're severe uh, MS um, and favorable anatomy, then you could reasonably perform also a balloon valvuloplasty kind of to prevent symptoms if they have elevated pulmonary pressure. So the ACC has demonstrated, as said, uh, pulmonary pressure of above 50 then you could do, it's reasonable to do a, a balloon valvuloplasty. Um, if you have asymptomatic patients with new onset of AF, then this could also be considered. Um, and on the basis of a pulmonary artery wedge pressure, there's also, if you have our pulmonary artery wedge of more than 25 and or a mean valve gradient of more than 15 during exercise, then you could also consider a valvuloplasty 
Um, and then if you have anyone who's severely symptomatic, uh, who has suboptimal anatomy, and those who are not candidates for surgery, they, even then you could also do a valvuloplasty or a balloon, even if they don't have suboptimal, if they don't have the optimal valve morphology, uh, because you know they're not uh, they're, they're not good surgical candidates. So it's kind of just you, know, you would try um, to to relieve their symptoms with a valve uh, uh, with a balloon. So what is us? Uh, how do we determine suitability for um, a balloon valvuloplasty? So I, I won't go into too much detail. Let's see how much time I have. Um, I won't go into too much detail on the Wil Wilkins score, but this was um, the Wilkins score was uh, was in uh, the late 1980s, um, and it was developed. I think they studied around 22, 25 patients, not many uh, patients, and their uh, optimal outcome was um, a reduction in the LA pressure of less than 10, then um, uh, an MBA uh, increase of, of less than 25%, and I think an MBA of less than uh, uh, 1.5 post procedure. Um, so the pliability or the suitability of the valves are taken via multiple uh, uh, multiple uh, grades. Uh, it's a scale of one to four. So uh, your minimum is four. Your maximum is sixteen. Um, and it takes into account what the leaflet mobility is. So examples of of a valve that would be a good candidate for a balloon valvuloplasty is a pliable or a mobile valve uh, with only the leaflet tips restricted. Um, thickening, whether there's, a, you know, there's near normal thickness or around four to five millimeters, this would be a more suitable valve. The thicker the valve is, the more structurally uh, difficult the procedure may be and the less suitable it may be for a balloon. Um, with regards to calcification, if there was kind of a single area of increased echo brightness, uh, in contrast to um, excessive brightness kind of all throughout the tissue. Um, and then also we do note subvabular thickening. So minimal thickening is, is, uh, is, uh, is better kind of for the, the mitral uh, balloon valvuloplasty. So a score of eight or more generally indicates uh, that the valve may have suboptimal response to a mitral valve uh, valvuloplasty, but that does not mean that these patients do not get these procedures. There are limitations in um, with regards to the Wilkins score. So the Wilkins score in itself it doesn't use any TE data. It doesn't use 3D data. Um, it does not address commissural fusion itself, which is the hallmark of rheumatic MS and is, is actually what is being targeted uh, with the balloon valvuloplasty. Uh, we aim to kind of open the commissures. So it doesn't address whether commissural fusion is present and the extent of that. Um, it may be difficult for uh, the Wilkins score to kind of differentiate nodular um, fibrosis from actually calcification in itself, just because it doesn't really mention it much there. Um, and it doesn't account for um, uneven distribution. And there may be some time, sometimes underestimation of your uh, subvagular disease. So, we do need to uh, exercise a bit of caution uh, when we are demonstrating the Wilkins score. It's helpful, and it's a high score indicates more severe anatomic disease. Um, but but we should not be kind of prohibiting patients just completely based on the Wilkins score, you know, without looking at the patient as a whole and their multiple uh, issues as well. So I guess uh, with regards to, I guess, take home points, the main thing would be rheumatoid arthritis is very severe, uh, very uh, uh, becoming more and more common in our general population now with more demographics. There are multiple ways in which we could um, assess our mitral valve area, the best of which are 3D echo, 2D, uh, 2D planimetry, but we could also use the pressure at half time. PISA and continuity equation can be used as well. Um, but less so. And then we also have, um, uh, we spoke about a little bit about our guidelines with regards to which patients should be managed, um, uh, which patients do we intervene, and our mild, moderate, and severe uh, mitral uh, stenosis. And we spoke a little bit about the Wilkins score and its role in guiding 
uh, management. Um, thank you very much. I think we have some time for questions or discussion. So thank you so much for giving this very comprehensive review of mitral stenosis. This is one of the area that is actually the most fascinating and with the most, to me, the most colorful history of cardiology. So um, I'll just add to your review of history. So in terms of echocardiography, what, what happened was when MO was first described way back when with the leaflet thickening and the reduced EF slope was one of the first ways to actually make the diagnosis of mitral stenosis. And uh, also in, in addition to the auscultation way back when. And when 2D echo first developed in 1979, uh, Randolph Martin um, and um, you know, with the group in Stanford when he was training, uh, developed you know, the concept of actually penimetry in 2D. So they would go into short axis, actually find the, what they call the limiting orifice, which is a funnel. And, and what they did was very interesting. They went into the operating room and actually used a little scale and put on the like you know the little square um, paper that you would use and actually count up the number of um, um, squares to actually calculate the valve area. So that was actually the first time that um, 2D was able to actually quantify anything, like because you know when echo was initially um, uh, developed, you know quantification is very common nowadays. But when when echo was first developed, quantification was like. We got poo put all the time by the cat people because they got the gallon and gallon formula on seven patients, et cetera. But um, so, you know, that was actually the first time that ECHO was uh, able to quantify. And then fast forward to a number of years later uh, by uh, Dr. Leif Hadley from Norway, who also spent a lot of time uh, training or visiting Saudi Arabia. In 1986, she developed the 220 uh, over uh, the pressure half time empirically. So this number is like, you know, draw, draw from, you know, the, the God's um, number. Uh, and uh, this, again, one of the first time in history that Doppler echocardiography was able to quantify valve area. And later on, in a, in a few years later, uh, Dr. James Thomas was the former lab director at Cleveland Clinic. And together with uh, Dr. Wayman at uh, Mass General was um, uh, able to actually derive mathematically like how that 220 actually comes up. And for anyone of you who are really interested in math and echocardiography, there's a whole description of the derivation in the Wayman uh, second edition. And fast forward a little bit further, the Wilkins score was done in 1988 at Mass General when Dr. Wilkins, Jerry Wilkins, uh, was actually a fellow from New Zealand who did this uh, project with uh, Dr. Igor Palacios and who is the, one of the pioneers in uh, uh, PMB uh, and uh, at the Mass General, and then they, they were having a discussion. That it's one of the privilege for me to actually hear from Dr. Wayman on person how they developed the score. So they want to publish this paper and like you know trying to quantify it, you know the outcome. And like they said, look, you know we can't just publish it because you have to be able to come up with a scale. So therefore, the scale of you know one to four for each of the four categories and sixteen and the cutoff of eight actually derive over the need of actually finding something to semi-quantified things. And again, one of the first time in echocardiography that semi-quantification and, and uh, with uh, features was actually developed. And even nowadays, we still use it despite some of the limitation. And it was developed before T was popular and it also developed before um, uh, harmonics was actually popular. So there's some interesting sort of like observation between the original score and later on these developments and 3D as well. Just to get, get back to the PMB, uh, percutaneous mitral valvuloplasty, which country do you think it was developed in? In 1982, a Japanese uh, cardiologist known as Kenji Inui uh, developed this uh, uh, in Japan because it was a, like a major problem in, in East Asia at the time. And uh, there was a single balloon and then uh, later on sort of developed with the waist in, be in between to allow the position. And then later on, there was a, four years later, a Saudi group also developed a double balloon technique. So you have to actually insert two balloons. But it turns out the single balloon was good enough. So the double balloon technique wasn't as popular. So even nowadays, um, the current PMB technique was actually direct inheritance from the original 1982 description from Dr. Kenji Inui. So it's a Japanese invention. That's very interesting. Thanks so much, Dr. Xiao.